Hi everybody, this is the first activity in our new unit on geologic time and natural selection. Before you watch this screencast, you should definitely do the Ash Falls activity form, which was a CER. Make your claim on what animal you think the bones slash fossils belong to. Why do you think it came from? That's your reasoning or your evidence. And then how do you know that? What knowledge do you have to back up that evidence? Then you should do the form where it has the pictures of what those fossils come from. You might be kind of surprised. And hopefully that makes you think of some questions. So those questions also should be added to that form before you watch this screencast. Um, all the information from this screencast as well as the pictures came from a PBS source, Paleo Sluice. The link is here at the bottom. Um, great place to go and do some further investigation if you want to do that. The information and description, I also want to give credit to the paleontologist on my Voorhees. So let's just get started. After you've done the activity with the bones of the creatures and you made a guess, then you saw the pictures of the actual animals. So the Ashfall Fossil Bed site is here in Nebraska. Um, here we are in the Omaha area. You'd have to go north and west a little bit. It is definitely worth a visit if you've never been there before. Very, very neat. Um, if you hopefully have done this part already, you made your claim, your evidence and your reasoning with the first activity form, and then you saw that living in Nebraska at some point in history, we had these elephant-like creatures, horse-like creatures, kind of looks like a cross between a rhino and a hippo. Also kind of looks sort of like a rhino, only it looks like there's two horns. Maybe if you've seen the Ice Age movies, I don't remember which one it was, um, they had creatures that kind of look like these. That might give you a clue. Camels. So hopefully you have a lot of questions dealing with those. We'll discuss them in our Zoom meetings or um, I will look at them online on the form, the second form you're supposed to fill out. Um, these questions, as we go through the unit, hopefully we'll get answered. Some questions um, would, might have to do with, we obviously don't have these animals here now. What happened to them might be kind of one big in your mind, like what, how did they die? So that's a question that we'll talk about and give you some more examples of what it was like at the time these animals were here. And again, the descriptions are by Mike Voorhees, who is a paleontologist, largely credited with the work at Ash, the Ashfall site. I'm just going to read through these. You can read with me, um, or you can mute me and read it yourself. Ashfall was an ancient water hole used by many different species. It's likely that herds of animals from a fair distance away came to Ashfall at different times each day. Herds of zebra-like horses would come in, and then maybe a bunch of camels later. It's pretty likely that rhinos spent a fair amount of time actually basking and wallowing in the water hole. The fossil rhinos we have here have short legs like a hippo. When the four tusker elephants came to the water hole to drink and bathe, it's probable that most other creatures left, since typically elephants are not very tolerant of other animals. At night, the meat-eating animals would come to Asheville to drink. Saber cats and hyenas, for example. There would be small creatures such as hedgehogs, too. So how did they die? Uh, basically, there was a really, really large eruption. And if you look at the picture here at the top, we can see what's known as a volcanic hotspot that resides in our country, in the lower 48 states. And as the North American plate has moved over the top of this hot spot, where the hot spot is located on our plate has changed. The hot spot itself really stays in the same position, but the plate moves over the top. So 13.8 to 12 million years ago, 
it was kind of right here in what is now kind of the corner of Idaho. And as the plates moved over the top, so it's moved to the west and kind of to the south, and then the hot spot looks as though it moves to the north and to the east. At the time of the eruption that killed all of the animals at the Ashfall fossil beds, this was the location. So you can see the name of it here, coincides with the name over here on this map. These are other locations, some other times where we've had some large eruptions in the past. This is the current location of this hotspot, and many of you might recognize this name. This is the current location of Yellowstone National Park. So Yellowstone National Park actually sits on the site of what is called a super volcano. A super volcano is a hot spot created volcano. So as the plate moves it will just continue to kind of move in the same direction. Um, a lot of questions kind of that come up as we discuss this is if the eruption 12.5 to 13 million years ago killed a bunch of material of, of living things covered a large part of the United States and ash could that happen again and the short answer is yes it could we do monitor Yellowstone very thoroughly currently so we probably know when that's happening but there really would be no way to stop it so um, 12.5 to 13 or 11.3 million years ago, in this current location of what we call today the Yellowstone hotspot, there's a giant eruption. So these gray, kind of oval shape, show the area covered by ash, and it really stretched all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. And you can see where ash fall fossil beds are, there was about one foot of ash. The darker the color, the deeper the ash would be. Um, beyond this would be less than one foot of ash. So what happened after that eruption? Day one, the ash cloud that descended on the water hole was not necessarily a visible cloud. The sky probably got dark. It probably first was like a haze. It'd be like the air in LA. You'd have a haze of material that came in. The sky would get darker and there, there would be this stuff coming out of the sky. Since these animals had never seen snow, this is probably something that was entirely new to them. It appears birds such as cranes, hawks, and vultures died quickly, possibly within hours of when the ash dust started falling. Their skeletons were found at the lowest levels of the ash beds, suggesting they were among the first to fall. Pond turtles were also among the early casualties. So this is all in day one. If you remember from your knowledge of volcanoes, this ash is really fine material, really like dust, but if you look at it under a microscope, it's tiny little pieces of glass, so it's very irritating to the eyes and the lungs, and it can very easily be inhaled. And days two through five, the dust came down hard and fast. The animals with the least lung capacity perished by the herd as gray powder covered the land. The fossil layer containing the small deer, three-toed horses, and camels is higher than the remains of turtles and birds, suggesting the an small animals survived a little longer. The ages of the animals and their states of preservation suggest they died in close succession. Three to five weeks. Ash hung in the air and coated every bit of vegetation. Each step kicked up more ash, contributing to the slow death from suffocation. Skeletons of camels, horses, rhinos, and other large animals show they had a lung condition known as Marie's disease. The animals were probably thirsty and suffering from high fever. After several weeks of inhaling the ash, their body temperatures went way up, and it probably felt good to them to lie down in the mud. It's unlikely that all the fossils in the ash bed were animals that just happened to be there at the time. The sickened animals probably came because they knew they could get water there. Rhinos survived the longest, up to five weeks. One to three months. After all had died, the remains of the animals, small and large, were covered by the blowing, drifting ash. A few scavenging meat eaters disturbed carcasses, but most bodies stayed in the same position in which they died. Some had their last meals in their mouths or stomachs. Remember this slide as we move on to our next lesson. One to two years. Ash remained in the air for years. 
The only thing that would make the ash stop blowing was when it fell into the water. The water would actually capture the ash, and when you look at the fossil bed that here at Ashfall, you can see that it consists of about 600 little separate layers of volcanic ash. Each one of those layers would be where a puff or of wind had delivered a cloud of dust. It was captured by the water and in the water hole. It fell to the bottom as a layer of ash mud. Gradually, five to six feet of ash covered the bodies. You could look any you could look in any direction, and there wouldn't have been anything alive. Probably for who knows several years before eventually the place where the water hole used to be was completely destroyed by the ash fall. Ten plus years later, plant life returned to ash fall when a river went out of its banks and started depositing sand over the top of the ash bed. Eventually, the same species of rhinos and camels and horses that had been destroyed by the ash moved back in and started eating the grass and shrubs that were growing there in the sand from the ancient river. Mount St. Helens in Washington saw the return of deer and elk just 10 years after its volcanic eruption in 1980. Also interesting reading if you want to investigate Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980. The same thing happened to ash fall. We don't have a good handle on how long it, it, that took, but as far as we know, nothing became extinct because of the ash fall. So hopefully by learning a little bit about this site here in Nebraska, you are curious about how, how all of these things work and are ready to learn more about earth history, fossils, and why these kind of creatures don't live here today. What happens when things become extinct? Who or what decides what lives?